Hello, and welcome to this week's Movie Math, where Stallone gambled and Stallone lost. Oh boy, this is bad. And it's interesting, Nev Campbell has a similar situation coming up just this next weekend. They're very different scenarios. Uh, Nev Campbell feeling she's not getting paid enough, but it's a dangerous game to see if a franchise can survive without you, because the answer might be yes. And that seems to be the answer when it comes to the Rocky Creed movies. Now, if you haven't heard, Sylvester Stallone has been very vocal about after uh, like the past year or so about wanting producer Erwin Winkler to gift the rights for Rocky back to Stallone, at least partially, despite their original contract. And Winkler fighting for Stallone, an unknown at the time, you know, back in the 1970s when Rocky was made, who couldn't get anyone else to make that movie, let alone star in it. But Winkler got the whole thing done, and he, Winkler even put up his own house along with the other producer so that the movie could be financed and be made. So, you know, the payoff for Sylvester Stallone was that he got to star in Rocky, which you know would usually never happen. He'd have to usually play Rocky's best friend. Um, and he became a huge movie star who didn't save his money because it's rumored that Stallone is having financial issues, which is probably driving this campaign. Uh, that led to him almost getting divorced. That's the rumor. Uh, and maybe why he's now trying to turn his family into the Kardashians. That can, that can generate a lot of cash, to be fair. Uh, and so he's also waged this campaign to get Winkler to, to give him the rights back. And as part of that, he refused to appear in Creed Three. And Creed Three is not only still doing just fine, but is thriving. It's a franchise best. Oh, it's so bad for Stallone. It's fantastic for everybody else. Creed Three debuted this weekend with almost 60 million, delivering a knockout to the franchise's other openings. It's ridiculous. I saw the movie again last night. So fantastic. I saw it on a premium screen. I had such a good time. Uh, and it's the biggest debut for any sports movie ever. Quite the feather in Michael B. Jordan's cap. I'm very happy for him. Now, some have argued that Michael B. Jordan, who makes his directorial debut here as well as stars again, should have still extended an olive branch to Stallone and said on the press tour when he was asked again and again, why isn't Stallone in the movie? He should have said, oh, it's too bad. I wish he'd been here. But instead, Michael B. Jordan said, you know, a lot of Creed fans have never even seen a Rocky movie. And I got to tell you, I'm on Michael B. Jordan's side. And let me explain. First off, I covered that Fantastic Four movie back in the day. And I even interviewed Michael B. Jordan on the red carpet at a New York City screening. And let me tell you, you could tell the toxic, unfair hate that he received for being cast as Johnny Storm, and he was quite good in the role, really genuinely changed him. If you want to understand Michael B. Jordan, you need to understand that that's something that he went through. Oh, it was horrible. Add to that Stallone forgetting to thank him and Ryan Coogler, who came up with the idea of reviving the Rocky franchise through Creed. Well, I mean, you saw the last Rocky Balboa movie. It was like, okay, but it was nothing like these new Creed movies. You know, Ryan Coogler reinvented that franchise and gave it new life. And Stallone forgot to thank him and Michael B. Jordan. I, it was horrible. I know a lot of you like to try and make excuses for Stallone, but it was horrible. Uh, and now Stallone turns his back on a very important movie for Michael B. Jordan, his directorial debut. It would have been great to have Stallone, at least in a cameo, but Stallone's like so concerned with his own situation, he really hurt, you know, I think it could have potentially hurt the film. I'm sure Michael B. Jordan was worried about it. So he doesn't need to kiss that ring. Michael B. Jordan needs to just move on, although he does extend kind of an olive branch uh, with Creed IV. Uh, Michael B. Jordan has said in interviews he'd love for Stallone to come back whenever Stallone would like to, but he doesn't feel bad he's not in this movie, nor should he, because that was a choice Stallone made. And moviegoers didn't miss him, and that is... Again, it's, it's quite the gamble to see if they will. Creed 3 has fantastic audience scores and strong diversity scores as well. That's also crucial. It has actually very similar breakdown to Black Panther, which was also a box office juggernaut. Black moviegoers are the biggest demographic, as you can see, but they certainly weren't in the theater by themselves. It's pretty solid across the board. That's a great 
breakdown. This is what we like to see in Hollywood. People interested in other people's stories and everyone getting a chance to see their own stories up on the big screen. Oh, I love it. The movie did skew, uh, skew heavily male though. And perhaps if the franchise continues to focus on Creed's daughter, they can fix that going forward. You, you know, most movies have about a 50, 50 split. A high sixties is unusual because, oh, they are definitely making more creeds, as I said. And again, Michael B. Jordan would love for Stallone to come back. Winkler is also set to produce a Drago movie with Dolph Lundgren, but the key to success for the Creed films, all of them, has been exceptional talent in front of and behind the camera. So if they can't line up that level of talent for Drago, they shouldn't even bother. Speaking of talent, this is a huge win for Jordan and Jonathan Majors. With Jordan, who's fallen off the radar a bit after a spectacular 2018 with Creed II and Black Panther, talk about a one-two punch, this shows he's still a major on-screen presence. It was a little touch and go there for a minute and bodes well for his upcoming Rainbow Six movie where John Wick's Chad Stahelski will direct. What a coup! Uh, Chad Stahelski needs that as well. Why he's not getting more work off of John Wick, who knows? But this might be it. That's an ensemble action film, and such a big showing here will help attract talent, other talent, to join Rainbow Six. They're like, whoo, did you just see what J uh, Michael B. Jordan did for Jonathan Majors? Let me get on that train. Because it is a huge boost for Jonathan Majors. Delivering, speaking of one-two punches, Majors is Quantumania and now Creed Three, both opening at number one back to back. Uh, Quantumania, though, has been disintegrating fast. So this win, the second win, proves that Majors ain't the problem with that movie. You know, Jeff Loveness, the screenwriter for Quantumania, has been going all over town to anyone who will talk to him, saying how sad he is that uh, his movie got such bad reviews. There ain't no crying in Hollywood! Uh, and he tries to, like, get the sympathy vote. I mean, where's the sympathy for making us sit through that movie? <laughs> I'd be like, cry for me, Jeff! Uh, but anyway, they also asked Jonathan Majors how he felt about the bad reviews. And he said, you know what? I asked my team how my reviews were, and they said I was just fine. <laughs> I loved it. He managed to be like, I'm good, without dissing the rest of the movie. He was like, my reviews, if you look for the Jonathan Majors section of the Quantumania reviews, they're golden. Uh, I sure hope he gets better people to handle his character going forward, because when you see uh, again, I saw Creed 3 again last night. He's so phenomenal in the role. You're like, look what he could be doing in the MCU and does do, I think, on Loki. So Loki season two can't get here fast enough to remind us of how great Jonathan Majors is as Kang. Uh, and then, of course, he has Magazine Dreams, as I've been talking about, coming out uh, for award season uh, at the end of this, this year. Or, I mean, we're just, we're just at the tail end of award season. But when the 2024 award season starts at the end of this year, Magazine Dreams is coming out from Disney Searchlight. They're releasing, that's formerly Fox Searchlight, and they're very good at getting movies, uh, nominations, and awards. So at the beginning of next year, I think Jonathan Majors should almost definitely be Oscar nominated. And a year from now... He might be an Oscar winner. I think there's a very strong chance. The rise of Jonathan Majors. He's so great. I saw a clip of him uh, online with Tamron Hall uh, talking to his former ac uh, acting teacher from college. Because, you know, Yale, he went to Yale, but that's a graduate acting program. And to see him break down in tears and be so moved by her continued support, oh, it's just a beautiful thing. Ah, great guy. All right, so anyway, back to Jordan. Uh, Michael B. Jordan, again, this is the, his directorial debut. Michael B. Jordan's like, I am also in this movie, thank you, okay? And Creed III's success ensures, I think, that he will direct again. I'd also like to point out how exciting it is to have back-to-back -back hits, not just for Jonathan Majors, but for, you know, different types of people in the director's chair. Elizabeth Banks for CB, and now Michael B. Jordan for Creed III. And they are directing impressive popcorn and franchise films rather than message movies, which is what di uh, diverse directors have been kind of contained to in the past. So it's exciting to see um, these very ex these wonderful opportunities for diverse talent behind the camera and to see them deliver and for audiences to support them telling these stories. Oh, it's an exciting time. It's an exciting time. And this is, I think, where we all wanted to get eventually. But obviously, Creed 3 is a much bigger hit than CB. And while Quantumania suffered another huge drop this weekend, whew, we'll talk about Quantumania in a second. But Quantumania still managed to hold on to second place as CB also suffered a big drop. In the 40s, a, a drop in the 40s, I think, 
would have been much better for that movie. Uh, so instead, I think CB is set to probably make most of its money, its real money, on digital, where it will most likely drop on the 14th, a week from Tuesday, because Universal has its now not-so-secret 17-day theatrical window, which I do think affects its box office somewhat. Since you know Universal has such a th short theatrical window, does it affect when you will see their movies in particular? I'm curious. I know some people who I've said that to. They're like, oh, wait, is it from Universal? I'll wait the 17 days. On that note, the industry is praising Amazon, who now owns MGM, for giving Creed 3 a full theatrical release instead of a muted one like Glass Onion, uh, or just sending it straight to streaming like Michael B. Jordan's Without Remorse. Uh, that, of course, also was due to the pandemic. Now, Without Remorse is nowhere near as good as Creed 3. Again, thank goodness they're bringing on Stahelski. Uh, it has some good sequences, though, and Michael B. Jordan is very good in the role. I see the potential for Rainbow Six, but I'm glad they changed up the talent behind the camera. Again, speaking of the importance of talent behind the camera. Uh, but it's an interesting point, I think, regarding Glass Onion, which ended up fizzling on Netflix and during this year's awards season. I think that one week re limited release in, in just a few theaters and then going away for a month uh, did not help the film. So Ryan Johnson, who's quite vocal and really has a lot of say uh, and sway at Netflix about how they treat his movie, he's the one who got that week release and might have shot himself in the foot. How many times is he going to shoot himself in the foot? But anyway, maybe Johnson can convince Netflix to do a full theatrical release with Knives Out 3, which is the final film in his extremely lucrative contract, him and Daniel Craig's contract with Netflix when they purchased Knives Out away from Lionsgate. We'll see what happens. That film, uh, Ryan Johnson's already writing it. Uh, although I have to tell you, I've spoken to some people who eventually got around to Glass Onion, and they weren't impressed. They weren't impressed. I think it was very niche, and I think it didn't have a Chris Evans in it. And I think that might have really affected it. Very interesting to me. Because I thought it was better. But I know a lot of people who thought the first one was better. Fascinating. But just because Quantumania managed to just slip down to second place instead of maybe third, that doesn't mean it's still not a total disaster. Oh my gosh, this is so bad. It's at just 186 domestic after its third weekend and 419 worldwide. And again, dropping fast. The bleeding has not stopped. It's going to be a struggle for the film to match the first Ant-Man, much less the second. So what was once a franchise best as an Ant-Man, and that bar was super low, is now a franchise worst, even for Ant-Man when you add that qualifier. And that proves the talk of an Ant-Man 4 was not just hype to try and prop up this movie. I told you, that's a trick. That's an old trick at this point. You should be wise to that. When they say they're going to make another one of these so close to the release, you know, not after the movie came out, like when Megan, after Megan came out, and then they gave a, 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 a go-ahead for the sequel, that's based on the strength of the debut. When they say they're going to make another movie before the current entry comes out, it's to try and make you feel like you should really see this one or you're going to fall behind. And then also, what a ridiculous idea it would be to make an Ant-Man for. I love Paul Rudd, and I certainly would love to see his character again. But in someone else's movie, they should never make another Ant-Man movie again. Still to go this year for Marvel are Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3 and The Marvels, with again The Marvels delayed from July to November for another round of reshoots as the movie is not testing well. The dreaded not testing well! Kevin, can these things even be saved in reshoots? I mean, it just, it's like, they just, you just get like a Frankenstein movie, man. Uh, Kevin Feige has been, uh, although some movies can be saved in reshoots, I want to be clear on that. Rogue One was saved in reshoots, gloriously so. Uh, although then Tony Gilroy was given free reign to make a series, which is really good for 50% of the time and, you know, didn't have a good audience and hurt the Star Wars brand. More on Star Wars in a second. But anyway, Kevin Feige has been fending off questions about superhero fatigue, but again, what about quality control? Uh, that seems to be very much on Bob Iger's mind. Remember, he's now Mr. Accountability as he tries to fix Disney post Chapek. But although, speaking of accountability, who picked Chapek? I believe it was you, Iger. And uh, it's going to be vital how the rest of 2023 plays out for Marvel. Likewise, Star Wars is off to not such a great start for the year either, with a weak debut for The Mandalorian Season 3, not really advertised, and a very short debut episode which frustrated fans. This week's episode on Wednesday, though, is very good. I mean, I've seen just the first two, and I'm telling you, the second one is excellent, so don't give up just yet.
Uh, as other studios and streaming services step up their game, Disney's choice to play it safe, which therefore sometimes means bland, and to rely on the love of their brand slash brands, like, it used to be like, how are you not going to see the next Disney movie? How are you going to see the next Marvel or Star Wars movie or show? But that no longer seems to be effective, especially when you add the political situation to the mix. As for the rest of the top 10, Outliers continue to thrive here with another anime movie delivering a strong debut and Jesus Revolution having a better hold than both Quantumania and CB. Meanwhile, Guy Ritchie's Operation Fortune finally hit theaters thanks to Lionsgate, but a small rushed ad campaign at the last minute delivered a why even bother debut. Should have gone straight to streaming and should be there very shortly. Magic Mike's Last Dance is already on streaming from Warner Brothers Discovery, and it is not doing well there either. Pretty embarrassing to try and sell sexy time and have audiences say, no thank you. As for streaming, as always, let's start with Nielsen, this time for the first week of February, where Black Panther Wakanda Forever hit Disney Plus and dominated. Thanks to intense interest and a three-hour runtime. Again, Nielsen measures viewership in minutes. Nobody could come close to Black Panther Wakanda Forever on the overall chart. Look at that. Whew. It's, it's, got, it's got a two in front of it. Uh, with another movie, Netflix's You People dropping just down to second place, a very strong second place in its second week. Uh, and The Last of Us, hot off of its third episode, remember this window ends right when the fourth episode aired, and that uh, thir episode three has definitely become the show's calling card. I said this show would live or die by uh, uh, that episode, and it has lived. Its audience, as you can see this week, blew up, going from number six on the overall chart for the last two weeks, now to number four, and on Acquired, it jumped from third place to second, as more and more people checked out the show as episode three became a phenomenon. Fascinating, fascinating. Fascinating stuff. The Last of Us has had crazy timing, though, going up against everything from the Grammys to the Super Bowl to the SAG Awards, with its finale next weekend, its season finale, going up against the Oscars. <laughs> that show is also renewed for a second season after it debuted, thanks to its strong numbers, not as a, a way to try and build hype. Although I think partially to build hype. I think maybe, you know, I think that was, that, that, that's a good case of it being a little bit of both. I think that it was doing, it was healthy, but they were like, ah, we need a little bit more juice. Let's also say we have the second season now to really kind of like get every, get the momentum going. And I'll be curious to see how, how the show finishes because it's, it's had some interesting choices, uh, which we're discussing week to week. Just two episodes left to go tonight and then next week. Uh, but it's still, you know, uh, the, the Last of Us has still managed to find, I think, a big audience. And it has had the winter pretty much all to itself with no other major shows debuting on streamers. Uh, so that's helped. So people can watch it later in the week if they don't watch it when it debuts uh, on Sunday night. Poker Face is, the, uh, is a show that came out during this period. And it's doing very well on the originals chart, but it still isn't generating enough viewership to even make the overall chart at all. You know, number two on originals, not even on overall. That's crazy. It's a fantastic show. And I think a big part of it not being on the overall chart is still Peacock not having a lot of subscribers. On the movies chart, Pamela, A Love Story had an okay debut, number four, but very low numbers, very low, uh, as you can see just in the 500 range. Well, JLo's Shotgun Wedding is also pretty low, but at least moved up a few spots from its debut last week. Over on Netflix, uh, for just this past week, We Have a Ghost and the Strays, Netflix original movies, had solid debuts, uh, while Your Place or Mine finally fell a little bit, and The Woman King, uh, they're doing okay this week. Uh, as for series, The Outer Banks Season 3 had a huge debut, as you can see, pushing you Season 4 down to fifth place, uh, with um, uh, Outer Banks also bringing in its previous seasons into the top 10, just as you has in the weeks previous. Uh, like you, Outer Banks has already been renewed for another season. Uh, and you, by the way, returns next week, uh, this coming week, actually, on Thursday. Uh, you, you season four, part two drops already. So we should see it uh, back in the top, uh, at the top of the top 10 shortly. And then Netflix had a Formula One docuseries debut to only okay numbers. Not great, not great. Uh, over on iTunes, a man called Otto also continued to have to think outside the box. You know, remember, it appealed to a very middle America white audience when it was in theaters. And they decided to come in hot, Sony, uh, with just a $15 price tag to purchase. Usually if you want to purchase a new movie that just had a theatrical release, you got to pay 30 bucks for it. And then if you want to rent it, it's like still 25. So just a $15 purchase. Look, number one, you can't argue with those results. Moviegoers continue to check out awards fair with the Oscars approaching a week from today. And look, we even have some more anime here as well. 
As for this coming week, wow, you have a lot of entertainment options. Get out your notepad. You're not going to want to miss this stuff. Or you could be a super follower to me on Twitter, and I'll let you know when it comes out day of. In theaters, not only does Scream return for its sixth installment, and again, Nev Campbell rolls the dice uh, as to whether or not you're going to miss her, but Sony's 65 and indie sports drama champions also hit theaters. Uh, 65 has press screenings the day of release on Thursday afternoon. So um, make of that what you will. We'll see how it is. Uh, on Tuesday, I'm, uh, I'm now including digital releases as well. So on Tuesday, Missing and 80 for Brady become available for uh, digital purchase. Well, as for new streaming movies, on Friday, Luther the Fallen Sun hits Netflix after a week in, the in like one or two theaters. And then Chang Can Dunk hits Disney+. Plus. As for streaming series, tomorrow, Monday, is huge. Perry Mason season two starts on HBO as uh, HBO continues to plant a flag in Mondays as well. So far, Chernobyl, The Gilded Age, and now Perry Mason season two. I've watched all of season two already. Fantastic. Really love the show. I recommend you try it out. And it's actually an ex. If you like classic movies in particular, you'll love it. And it's actually an excellent weekly watch because you feel pretty full after each episode. And who doesn't love Matthew Reese? Then on uh, Hulu, History of the World Part 2, based on the famous Mel Brooks movie, kicks off its week-long comedy star-studded event with two episodes a night through Thursday. So that should be a lot of fun. I love historical humor. It reminds me very much of like Monty Python, British humor, and stuff like that. And I loved the original Mel Brooks movie. Uh, it's one of his best, if you're not familiar with Mel Brooks's uh, catalog. And you should be. He's very good. And speaking of uh, Thursday, as I said, you season four is already back with part two. Then on Friday, Carrie Washington has a new comedy uh, also on Hulu about a therapist and single mom who adapts to her dad, played by Delroy Lindo, being released from prison and moving in with her and her son. Uh, while Netflix has outlast a survivalist reality competition. And that's this week's movie math. What have you been watching? What do you plan to watch? What do you think of Creed 3's success? Uh, you know, the Stallone factor. What it, uh, also, what do you think it's gonna, how, how do you think it's gonna go down for Nev Campbell this coming week, uh, weekend? And uh, what do you think of uh, Michael B. Jordan and Jonathan Major's success off of Creed 3? And then, what do you think about Quantumania continuing to fall apart? Share those thoughts down below, subscribe today, and of course, as always, you can check out some more videos right now.